Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young, licensed clinical social worker. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there to the creatives, healers, sensitives, deep thinkers. Thank you so much for joining me. One of the things I don't think I've made really clear to people, and I apologize for this, but this podcast is for anybody who considers themselves to be sensitive. Although I talk a lot about being a highly sensitive person, that's the framework that I work with and that's my specialty. I also had a listener ask me if and I'm so I'm always so afraid of using the wrong language. So if I use the wrong language, somebody please gently correct me. I had a gentleman ask me, he said, you know, I'm not gay and I'm sensitive. Like, do you have to be gay to be sensitive? And I told him, absolutely not. 50% of highly sensitive people are men. So it's divided equally between men and women. I don't have any stats on if there's a division of um, guys that are gay, if you know, they tend to run higher in being HSPs. One has nothing to do with the other. Sensitivity is an innate trait that we're born with. It's not due to trauma. It's not due to a poor childhood. It's genetically how we're wired. And they've done brain studies and fMRIs that show that the way that our brains are wired are just different. We're much more responsive. I'm not a researcher, so I really try and avoid talking too much about the science behind it because I just don't want to screw it up. You don't have to be a highly sensitive person to listen to this podcast. And the research term is sensory processing sensitivity, and it runs equally among genders. And I don't think that there's, I, I don't know what the research says, but oh, I'm just afraid I'm digging myself into a hole, so I'm just going to stop. This is episode five. In this episode, Dr. Melvin Varhees joins us. It's an amazing conversation. There's lots of laughter. I do want to let you know that we recorded two podcast episodes and I don't have the expertise yet to be able to cut and paste and make it sound like a cohesive interview. So it sounds like it's two different interviews. We start out laughing and you'll understand why once it starts. The order of the questions that I do is totally out of order. This is just kind of a, it's a delightful episode. I love Melvin's candor and he talks about the fears that kept him from moving forward, and he is an incredibly successful entrepreneur with a number of businesses that I'll tell you about. He talks about the fear that comes up for him and how he does what he needs to do in spite of the fear, and I love that about him. So what you're going to hear is we start out laughing. We'll tell you why. We do the questions out of order that we normally do. Then I kind of jump in and give you a warning that now we're going to go in for an abrupt transition, and then it sounds like we're doing an entirely different interview, and this is where Melvin talks about what he did in his own business to prepare for the birth of his child. And he had some amazing tips and he's incredibly disciplined. I really admire him for his discipline. Anyways, let me tell you a little bit about Melvin. And then I've got one more thing I want to tell you. So Melvin has a podcast called Selling the Couch, which is incredibly popular. He also has a course called The Health Casters, which um, is a course that I took to learn how to do my podcast. He has an online directory for therapists called Selling the Couch Directory. Melvin also has a private practice where he helps entrepreneurs overcome the mental roadblocks that prevent success. He's an incredible humanitarian. He comes from a different culture. He's overcome lots of adversity. I just really loved this interview with him. I don't know if you noticed, but I shortened up the introduction. I'm trying to jump right in and get to our interviews faster than we have been. So thank you for bearing with me. If you live in California and you want to work with me, you can head over to my website at patriciayounglcsw.com. I think you'll really love listening to Melvin. He's just delightful and genuine. You can just hear the sincerity in his voice. I hope you enjoy it. All right. We are recording now. <laughs> <laughs> we can start with a laugh. That's fine. I'm hey, Melvin. <laughs> it's Patricia. Hey, Welcome Patricia. to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so do you want to actually share what, what actually happened in the, the first time we recorded this? 
Yes. So Melvin and I just had a 20 minute recording of a wonderful conversation that we were not recording. (laughs) Yeah. But so I don't know who's going to learn of this conversation, (laughs) the two of us, but uh, no, it's, uh, you know, for us, I think for me, I think I used to stuff like this used to happen. I used to be so hard on myself, you know, I think as an HSP, um, but now I don't know. I'm trying to learn just to roll with the punches. You know, sometimes stuff happens and uh, that's okay. You know? Absolutely. What I was saying is I did an interview with someone the other day and we had this great interview and it ended and I thought it didn't record. And actually I- I'm not throwing you under the bus, Melvin, but um, Melvin's recording this interview because we did another interview. And so he had stopped and like, Hey, I didn't do it. And like, Hey, it's okay. We'll just go with the flow. And it is so freeing because you and I are both very, you know, thoughtful and mindful and, you know, let's get there 20 minutes early and make sure that we have everything. We've got our notes and we've got our snacks. And so when stuff goes wrong, at least in the past, it would totally freak me out. And I'm like, eh, it's fine. We'll just do it over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you're right. It is very liberating because I think for me, it used to just derail me, you know, and then I found when I when things like that would happen, I had this like internal critic that would always come and be like, Mel, what happened? Why didn't you get that right? Like, how could you let that happen? And I don't know, there's just a lot of unhelpful dialogue that I don't know, ultimately didn't really serve me except just made me feel worse. Well, and I think it's part of the trait of being a highly sensitive person that because we're such deep thinkers, we're really great at strategizing and troubleshooting and forecasting. And so we tend to be really prepared We have a hard time making decisions because we want to consider every angle, but because we really want the best outcomes, we tend to do everything that we can to have a good outcome. And when it doesn't happen, we tend to be pretty hard on, on pretty hard on ourselves until we figure out that that's kind of what the dynamic is. And then like today, like we laugh about it and go like, "Ah, oh, well. Yeah. Stuff happens. Right. And that's, I don't know, for me that you just said it really well, which is, I just, I'm learning that we can plan, plan, plan and implement. And, but there's just some element of this that we don't have control over. And either we let it um, just, you know, wear us down and we criticize ourselves for it, or we just roll with it, you know? It's kind of like having a roadmap and then deciding that maybe you want to take a little side detour, that it's so easy when we tend to be driven by anxiety, that it's easy to get into planning in order to alleviate the anxiety. But then sometimes the plan ends up taking over to mm-hmm. the expense of the human being and the human being's needs because we got we to gotta stick to the plan because it's to alleviate anxiety as opposed to this is to help guide me to where I want to go, but I can get off the path and do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. That's a good way of looking at it. Um, Yeah, it's a lot more, that perspective is a lot more mindful, right? It's a lot more acknowledging of sort of the present experience. Yeah. Or you can go through life kicking and screaming because the rules aren't working out. I did that for a lot of years. It really wasn't very fun. (laughs) (laughs) I did that for a while too. Uh, Yeah, I I wasn't very fun. (laughs) You know, I joke that growing up, it's like the rules had rules, you know? (laughs) So, Melvin, do you identify as a highly sensitive person? I do. And um, I was telling you this. I, honestly, you know, I, I grew up and I just growing up, I remember just being just feeling things a lot deeper, uh, feeling like I didn't quite fit in, um, just being, you know, like very sensitive to like my own feelings, sensitive to the feelings of others. And, and I think for me, especially just being sort of looking at like sort of gender stereotypes, especially being like a male, a minority male, like all of those different dynamics. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I don't know, for a long time, I just, in a way, I try to fight against who I was. And I always try to like aspire, I should be this person, but I'm this person, you know, like that sort of tension. And um, I didn't know, like I was an HSP until like, honestly, until this year, because I just never, one, I'd never even heard of that phrase. But when I started reading up on it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is really accurate. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it was liberating for me. So what changed for you when you learned about some of the traits of being a highly sensitive person? Well, one, I think the biggest thing is I just gave myself permission to be me. Um, and mm. not place like undue expectations about who I should be. Oh, that is beautiful. 
Yeah. Um, it's, it's still a work in progress, you know, but I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I, I think the more, uh, I mean, we, I have a, a young daughter now and I think I especially think about that, um, being a father to her that, you know, what do I want to teach her? You know, that, um, and I want to hopefully teach her that she is her own person and she can make decisions and that she, she can be her and she doesn't have to sort of fall into some sort of conforming thing that, you know, that my wife, I, I expect her to be. Yeah. What a gift too, that you will be able to give her because of your own ability to be in touch with your feelings and emotions that you'll be able to mirror and respond to her in a way that a dad who's not an HSP, no fault, no blame to all the non HSP dads, but you know, what a gift that you will be able to give her where she will feel so seen and heard and valued by you. Yeah. Um, I hope so. You know, I, I don't know. I, there's a really good quote that I, I'll, I'll see if I can like share with you, but I just realized through this whole parent parenting thing, like, you know, the whole point isn't to make <clears throat> like a carbon copy of me or my wife. Right. But the whole point is to create, you know, is to have a daughter who is kind and responsible and a good citizen, you know, and that she develops the capacity to make, to think through decisions and make decisions that align with who she wants to be. Mm, I really like that. What do you think of the term highly sensitive person? Um, I, I understand it, but I, I could also, I don't know, it's weird because, you know, we're, we're talking in the context of this podcast. Um, I imagine this is other, a lot of H, other HSPs are hearing this, but I feel like, that that phrase itself, I don't know, to me, there's still like a little bit of stigma around it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you're an HS, you're a highly sensitive person. Uh, I don't know if I want to, you know. Is that eye roll? You or... <laughs> Insert eye roll. Yes. Okay. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I think that's the biggest thing, right? There is this like weird sort of simultaneous embracing as well as a simultaneous stigma around it. Yeah. I, that's why I asked the question. You're not the only one. Hmm. Um, is there another term that you would prefer? You know, if this was Melvin's world, what would you want to call it? I don't know. <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question. I mean, I don't mind. I, to me personally, I don't mind highly sensitive person because I just, for me, that, that encompasses what I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll have to think on that. I can't think of something right now, but to me, the HSP, it, it seems to fit. Um, but I was just saying, I, I could see where there's stigma around it. Yeah. So how do you feel about being an HSP? Um, <laughs> interesting. Good. I mean, it's, it's weird, you know, like uh, in the, in the recording that did record, <laughs> we, were, we were talking about um, me growing up in India. So I, I was, the the child of immigrants. Um, my I was born in India. I, I went to school there until the first grade. My parents immigrated to the U.S. Uh, we moved to Texas in the second grade, and then I have lived in the U.S. since. So um, it's interesting. I think being identifying myself as an HSP because of sort of the the cultural sort of stuff. And again, not to be like like overly broad, but you know, like strong stereotypes around gender roles um, within Indian culture um, and then not quite fitting into those sort of stereotypical gender roles. Um, and then also, I think just, um, so there's the cultural piece, there's the gender piece, and then there's this sort of mixing, right? So living in one culture, moving into another one. And then my parents, uh, they really wanted us to spend a lot of time in India, even growing up. So I would say two and a half to two to anywhere from two to three months of the year, we would actually go to India and, and live there, especially during the summer months. So that was interesting, you know, growing up really nine months in one culture and three months in another. Yeah. Can you share again about, um, and I have it written down if you don't remember, but what the cult, because what I had asked you in the previous recording that didn't record was you know, how is sensitivity viewed in India? Obviously, we know in the States, it's not valued 
at all because you're supposed to be independent and pull yourself up by the bootstraps and cry or I'll, you know, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. So what's your sense of what the value is around sensitivity in India? Yeah. So I think one thing for me is, um, so sensitivity, that word, when I, when you initially asked me that question, what I kept thinking was, uh, so Indian culture, just again, these are broad brushstrokes, but generally Indian culture is more collectivist um, versus sort of an independent culture, right? Um, but, and so sensitivity for me growing up meant that uh, the ne- my needs were important, but so were the needs of my family, my neighbors and all of those things, right? And so my needs shouldn't be so much that I neglect the needs of those around me. So for example, if, you know, um, like I'll give like a really practical example, um, the state that I'm from Kerala, um, they had a crazy like monsoon season. There was a lot of flooding, a lot of people lost their homes. And, um, my parents, uh, a couple of weeks ago had, you know, asked me, uh, one of the families that, uh, we are, we, um, you know, they, they help us a lot when we go to India. Um, they lost like part of their house in this flooding. And so, um, we were just talking about like, you know, how can we support them, whether it's financially, those kind of things. And, um, I don't know, it's just, it's interesting. Cause I, you know, I live here in the U S right. Like I'm an entire continent in a way, but that sort of mentality, right. That, you know, my, my, how do I take care of my brother and sister? Right. Um, even though they're not like related to us, right? Mm-hmm. But how did their needs, right? We I see them that they're suffering, right? And so that suffering should cause me to act. I don't know why I'm getting emotional about this, but um, yeah, that that their suffering should cause me to act, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. I just that's one of the things that I most value about our culture is um, there's downsides to it, of course, but you know, it's that. I was very fortunate, I think, to grow up in a family and in a culture where everything was not about my needs, you know, even mm-hmm. with, and I think that's something that even as I've grown to be an adult, um, that's something that, I don't know, it's been so important to me. Like, um, we can talk about this, but like my, if it's important, um, but my wife and I, we actually met on a humanitarian trip where we rebuilt houses hit by Katrina, right? Mm-hmm. And so I don't think we would have met without that. Um, we, you know, fortunately now, you know, we're, we do a lot of stuff around um, supporting um, women and children who've been rescued from human trafficking, even like stuff we do with selling the couch. We, we're, you know, in the process of creating the scholarship fund for kids that have been rescued from brothels. Like I've never, for me, um, like business has never been just about business, right? It's been more of like, so there has to be like sort of this social mission or social justice um, mm-hmm. component to it. And I see that as being one of the values of highly sensitive people mm-hmm. is having a really strong sense of social justice. And, you know, so it sounds like what I hear you saying is that your business is a means for you to do the social justice work that you have very strong feelings about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think initially when I started selling the couch, it was, um, it was okay. I want to be able to serve our field well, right? Um, but I think as selling the couch has evolved, that that's still important. But now I also see it as you know, been very just blessed and fortunate to create this platform and have a voice. And and do I just create um, with this voice? Do I just create a business and do I just make income? Like, is that the whole point of it? Um, it's never been like that is not satisfying beyond a certain level. Right. So what I now think about is like, now that I've created this platform, what, how do I use it to leave the world a better place um, to do things that maybe I couldn't do individually? Which is one of the gifts I see is being able to be leaders in our community is that we can use the platforms that we have to talk about our social justice issues and to make differences where we can. And that's exactly what I see you doing. Hmm. Um, yeah, no, thanks for it. There's, I don't know, there's just, there's something a lot more gratifying about that, you know, like mm-hmm. that business success doesn't end just with a financial goal that maybe what we've done is it's impacted somebody else's life, you know, maybe just 
immediately, maybe even for a generation, you know, or beyond. And in the recording that no one but Melvin and I will ever know about, <laughs> um, two of the quotes that I wrote down that you had said, Melvin, was living in India, life was about who you were surrounded by and you were raised with the value of how do we serve those around us. And I see you doing that so beautifully in your work and it's really impacted how I function as a clinician and thinking about in terms of being of service. And I think especially for people that are highly sensitive, we really do have a desire to make the world a better place and to make a difference. And because of our, I'm not going to say everybody, but sometimes our own self-consciousness gets in the way. But when we think in terms of service, it helps us kind of get out of our own way to be able to show up for people in meaningful ways. Yeah. Um, you just said that really well. I don't even think. I <laughs> um, yeah. You, you can uh, go home now. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> what are some of the challenges that you experience as a highly sensitive person? Um, the challenge I think is still that I, I get overwhelmed. Uh, if it's like a lot of stuff going on, you know, me too. Um, I'm, I'm really good with containing it. So somebody that doesn't know me well, they could be like, oh, well, you look so calm, but I'm like, internally, there's just a lot of stuff that's building up and I've, I don't know, I'm learning. Uh, I feel like stumbling <laughs> more like, uh, just trying to not do that or, or recognize when I'm starting to get overwhelmed and, you know, and I don't know, I, I feel like, again, for me, I feel like self-care and and highly sense and high sensitivity go hand in hand, you know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And in part of the interview that um, we haven't pieced this together, Melvin and I recorded an episode for his show that will be aired after this one comes out. So we're going to piece it together. So at this point, I don't know if you've already heard it or if it's coming up <laughs> in the show, but you know, you had talked about self-care being really important in what's going on in your life and having a new baby. And for those of us that are HSPs, having those basic fundamentals are so crucial to our well-being. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, again, this is like a realization the last couple of weeks, but I feel like things like getting sleep, quality sleep, um, eating well, exercising well, like that stuff is to me is as important as like oxygen, you know, mm -hmm. for the HSP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we need that to function well. And when we don't know that we're HSPs, it can really take a toll on our lives. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think for a long time, I, I fought, you know, it's I alluded to it earlier. I, I felt like here, here was me. Uh, this, this kid who was like really sensitive and, but on the other hand, like, am I supposed to be this way? Like, I felt like, shouldn't I be somebody else? And, you know, that sort of weird tension, that was very difficult. Well, you had two things. You were in a new culture and you're a male and you're sensitive. Hmm. So you really had a triple whammy. I think it's hard enough just for boys who are raised in our culture that are sensitive to deal. And then coming from a culture that had a collective consciousness to an individualistic. I mean, it just feels like it was a lot. I bet it felt like a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, looking back, it definitely was a lot, a lot to navigate, you know? Um, and to be honest, Patricia, like it's only here been here in the last couple of years where I've really started to own like who I am, you know, um, because, and even still, you know, like, I, I still battle against that, you know, day to day. It's an ongoing process. And I find that no matter what situation I'm in, I was in a group yesterday of people that I had the expectation that we would have very similar values. And I found myself wanting to leave the group and all of my gremlins came up, you know, I'm too much. I'm too needy. I share too much. I'm not like these people. They don't mm -hmm. like me. They don't see me. They don't value the work that I'm doing. And mm -hmm. I, I really had to look at, you know, that that's my wounding and what do I need to do to heal that wounding? Cause it may or may not have been going on. I could have just project been projecting all of it, but I bring this up to say that no matter at what stage in our life and how much work we've done, like that wounding still comes up and we always have healing to do. Hmm. 
And I think maybe part of, like it's related to that part of it is that we start to see the wound, right? When mm-hmm. it presents as a, because I know for me, a lot of times I would just feel this overwhelming ball of emotion. And I like, frankly, I didn't know what to do. I would just get so overwhelmed and then I would get sad and anxious and, you know, and overwhelmed. Yeah. Well, and often what happens is, you know, we're picking up on something that's going on for the other person. And what, what I was wondering in this situation is, I think that people sometimes don't know how to handle me. Not that I need to be handled, but, you know, you and I had talked about, you tend to be much more on the private side and I'm kind of out there and what you see is what you get. And if I'm thinking something or feeling something, I'm going to share it. And in this group of people who are my peers and I would have expected them to be very similar, which is my expectation. That's a huge thing with HSPs is expectations and disappointments. Mm -hmm. They're not like that. And I think that they don't even know how to respond to me. So what, because my history is about silence meant disapproval. So if somebody's not responding to me, I automatically go into that wounding place of, you know, they're judging me, they're criticizing me, something's wrong, I'm being too much. And Mm. they just may not even have the skill set to know how to deal with someone who's just kind of so upfront about what's going on, you know, and that's where we make up a story in our head. And then, you know, we create this whole experience that that may not even be happening. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess part of this for me is like, even as you're talking, I just realized like, part of, I think, being HSP is realizing who we are and not taking more responsibility than we what we need to mm-hmm. for other people and other people's emotions and where they are at and all of those things. Yeah, because often we'll be picking up on something, but it's this, the meaning that we attach to it, the story that we make up in our head about it mm-hmm. is where we can really misinterpret what's going on. And if we have wounding, and most most of us have gotten some negative messaging about what it means to be highly sensitive, we insert that into the meaning, and then we're having a whole different experience that may not even be happening. Hmm. That's a good, um, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, I noticed that, I I mean, I still do that, uh, but I I was doing it a lot more, but I, and I still do. Um, I don't know, it's something I still have to check myself a lot on. You know, um, well, I, th- I think it's always going on for us because we're picking up on way more than your non HSP does. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I want to talk about something fun. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. So what do you do for play Melvin? Oof. Uh, well, literally <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I grew up, um, I'd never touched a basketball when I was growing up in India. And when we moved to the U S I don't know what it was, but I like fell in love with basketball and I used to play in like rec leagues and um, play in like in little tournaments and all this stuff. And then I like tore my ACL in college and, and got to grad school. And I was like, kind of give up basketball for a while, but um, here in the last uh, several years, I've you know, got ACL surgery, rehabbed all that. So I play basketball. Um, we, have a good group of guys that I play every Saturday morning, six thirty to eight thirty, like full court games, five on five. <laughs> so uh, that's how I take care of myself. Um, I also do, a, you know, exercise and stuff throughout the day. But um, uh, yeah, basketball is definitely a big thing for me in terms of play. Um, and I think for me also, I just I, I love spending time with my family. I don't need like big events or anything. I just uh, I really value like a quiet night where we can read or watch a movie, or you know, cook a meal together or just something like that. And they have quiet walks on the beach, holding hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> Um, I love the fact that you have a team sport that you can play with other guys on a regular basis. I think that is so important. You know, again, it goes back to that. And I don't think in the framework of the collective and the individualistic, but I think that's so valuable. Yeah, I know it is. Um, You know, what's really interesting is there are some really deep conversations that happen during like when people are not playing during those games, Mm -hmm. just about life. And it's interesting. I don't know if it's sort of just for men or what it is, but once it's surrounded by an activity, you know, it's somehow like the act- activity makes vulnerability a little bit easier. Yeah. I think men connect by doing more. Like, you know, if you had somebody over and you just told them to sit down and talk deep, like it's just not going to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, what are some of your superpowers being a highly sensitive person? Um, well, 
uh, well, you identified one and I actually don't even see the superpower, but because I think I just so used to it, but I feel like I'm really good with like systems, you know, like I'm good with being able to look at, for example, like what I'm doing in the business and being able to take a step back and say, is this the best way to do it? Can I do this more efficiently? Can somebody else do this better than me? Um, can this free up more time? So I think one of my like gifts has been um, being able to be in my business and sort of work in the day to day, but being able to take a step back and say, what is the big vision for all of this? You are really good about that. I remember when I pitched an idea for you about being on your podcast and you were able to say like, this is what my podcast is about. So this would fit in that wouldn't. I'm like, I never even thought about it. Those kinds of terms. Like I just kind of show up and say whatever. So I've, I'm always really impressed by not only your discipline, but you really do have an amazing ability to see the big picture. And I'm one of those like, what's in front of me? What's fun? What do we want to do? <laughs> it's hard, you know, and it's not that I don't struggle with that at all, you know, because I feel like especially in this world of social media, I mean, there are so many, especially for our field, right? There's so many like online communities for therapists and people and our colleagues are just, they're doing some amazing things, right? And it's, it is easy just to be like, oh my gosh, I should be doing that. And I don't know, I still struggle with that. But I also, I'm just realizing, you know, we, um, you know, we just with the baby and my time is so finite now. And I'm not like being a father and being, having responsibility for my daughter um, and just the time that takes that means that I'm not going to be able to build my business to a certain level, perhaps that someone that doesn't have those responsibilities, you know, just mm -hmm. because I don't have as much time. Yeah. Any other superpowers? Cause you have more. Mm, um, man, um, I think I'm able to like be in situations that are like highly charged and um, deescalate mm -hmm. situation. Um, even like examples, like, you know, there's been tough conversations and tough, dif difficult things with, within the, you know, the Facebook community and, and things that have even brought up like emotions for me. But I know that if I always respond based, based on what I feel in the moment, that's probably not the best thing. Right. And so, um, I think just being able to take a step back and trying to say, you know, okay, I can understand where they're coming from. And, um, I don't know. So the, I think being able to contain, hold my emotions and still try to see the perspective of others, that would, I would say is probably another one. May I tell you what I see some of your superpowers? Oh, I'm curious. I think you get uncomfortable when I tell you these things. That's the story I'm making up in my head. Do you? Yeah, I don't like to, uh, I don't like, uh, <laughs> I don't like, uh, what's the word, like positive attributes being pointed <laughs> Do you want to skip it? Cause it's, it's totally not my intention to make you feel uncomfortable. No, I'm no, actually I want you to, because I feel like this is part of it too, right? Like just because we're in HSP doesn't mean that we're not growing and you know, we're not trying to stretch. So I'm happy. Like I would, yeah, I'm curious and open to it. So I'm going to take a little side detour because oftentimes, you know, Melvin and I have never met in person, but we've been in a couple of online groups for a few years. So we've developed this relationship through an on, you know, online forum. And there have been times when I'm pretty effusive about how I feel about people. And then you've never responded. So the story that I made up in my head is like, you think I'm lying. It's too much, you know, so it's interesting that your discomfort, I attached a meaning to it. Huh. That is interesting. Um, and honestly, it could just be, <laughs> I try to, I, so what I usually, this is the real sort of practical thing. I block out time for social media mm -hmm. and then I realize I can only respond in a certain amount. Uh, otherwise I'd be on social media all day long. I know it's another place where you're so darn disciplined. Um, and, and I just share that to say that if there are other people that have that experience, like, you know, you just kind of learn that that's how it is and it's not a big thing, but I just wanted to take a moment to be transparent. But your heart, Melvin, shows through, and it's funny, like, I can always hear you smiling in your podcast. Like, I can't see you, but I can hear you smiling. But you have such a warm, generous heart, and I know that everything that you say and do is coming from a place with just intentions of love and caring and even when you're talking about in the community when you've had to have difficult conversations your sense of caring and compassion like it, 
those values are so in the forefront of everything that you do in your value of service and gratitude. I don't, it's like, my guess is you probably know, like people just want to be around you because you just kind of emanate this lightness, this not lightness, but light, like good light. Mm. Um, thank you for saying that. I, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. I, I try to just, and I do, I, I totally smile doing podcast episodes. <laughs> just because I'm, I don't know. I think I'm just so grateful people take the time to listen. And I mean, it's, it's neat to be, you know, to be honest, when I uh, became licensed, I either imagined, imagined working at a university counseling center and doing a small part-time gig. I never imagined creating a podcast, creating this whole platform, like all of that. And I think part of why I smile is just to be in gratitude, one, for all of these things. And two, I don't know, I'm just, you know, I think the the sensitive part of me, I've always like doubt myself, you know, and my ability to do things, even though I can get things done, if that makes sense. Um, and so like fear, I think has often crippled me. And I think I smile because I, I just, it's, it is neat to see that I took a step and, you know, and I, and I acted with boldness and things came out of it that I never anticipated. And I don't know, now that I have a daughter, I, I think a lot about that even more because I just, I want to be a good model for her, you know, about taking risks and, and living life to the fullest and not having regrets. And one of the things that I see you consistently model is courage isn't about waiting until you have the courage. Courage is about having the fear and doing it anyways. And you've been so transparent about your process and the fears and the insecurities and the doubts that come up. And for any of us that are doing new things, that's the stuff that comes up. But when we talk about it, we normalize it. And you've done such a beautiful job with that. Um, no, thank you for saying that. I I think for a long time, I was like a plan, 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 but never do. Mm -hmm. And I just, I realized, and I think, one, honestly, I think launching the podcast was a big mental hurdle because it really wasn't about launching the podcast. It was actually about feeling like no or owning my own voice and realizing that I had a perspective that mattered. And then also it was more about just overcoming my pushing myself out of my comfort zone, you know? And I think once I did that, I think a lot of these subsequent steps became a lot easier. It was almost like this like dam got opened, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one more question or do you need to go? Uh, no, we can, we can do one more question. This is fun. <laughs> I, every time you say something, I just want to keep asking you more questions, but I know we've got a time limit, so I want to be respectful. What would you want to tell your younger self about being a highly sensitive person? Hmm. I would say um, just to be kind and gracious to yourself. Um, don't feel the pressure to conform um because like you're not gonna fit into like a perfect box uh but um and nor should you you know but i think if if you continue to develop who you are um there's gonna be a lot of great qualities that will come out and i mean i think about that now right like if i was talking to somebody like my middle school or high school self and i could look forward and and see all the things that I've been able to do just because I started to own who I was, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I would just, if I could, I would just give them a glimpse into like what my life was and now, you know? Yeah. The overall theme that I getting from you is just that thing of self-compassion. It's really accepting where we're at, having mm -hmm. compassion and grace and allowing for the fear, the imperfection, the flaws, you know, and that allows us to be in a place of gratitude and really feel joy. Yeah, um, I think along uh, the self-compassion, I think is so key because for a long time, I just spent a lot of time like criticizing myself mm -hmm. internally. And I think that didn't do anything except just like bring me down even further. So um, I think once I started, this is like a really subtle thing, but I, and I can't always do this, but I don't put my self-worth in the results of something mm. right if something doesn't work out it just means it didn't work out um so it just means that we just got to figure out another way to to make it to make it work it just means that situation it, it's not that 
I'm an, I'm not a competent person or I don't have any good ideas or everything I do is going to fail. I love that. Melvin, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. This has just been delightful. I have about a million more questions that I want to ask you, but it'll have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, thank you so much for having me, Patricia. I, uh, I am grateful for you. Um, I don't know, in, in many ways, I think you're the person that, you know, the things that you've posted, the things that you've shared, um, I think it's helped me to own who I am. And so I'm grateful for you for that. Thanks. I'm tearing up. All right. Thanks, Melvin. Have a great day. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. So this is one of those places where the track jumps from one part of the interview to another. Just giving you a heads up. I'm looking forward to this honest conversation. I'm really excited to be here and to be asking you some stuff. So when you were preparing for the baby, business-wise, what were some of the things that you prepared regarding outsourcing? Oh, that's a good question. So, uh, and I, I briefly mentioned this on the, the intro of this episode, but uh, originally our baby was supposed to come in September and I'm a planner. So I had started, you know, thinking about what would my business look like? What are the stuff that I'm doing that's sort of like day-to-day -day kind of stuff that I can start to outsource? So um, those kind of things. But then she ended up coming in July. So she was a preemie. And so that threw a lot of stuff into, into a flux. But to answer the original question, in terms of outsourcing, what I literally did was I created a, I took a blank sheet of paper out and I started writing down every little task that I did related to the business on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, no matter how like small it was, I just wrote it down. Uh, just one, give me a visual of all the stuff I was doing, which that itself was very eye-opening. And then two, I think it gave me this, um, some sort of a, a framework by which to say, you know what, am I the best person to be doing this? Could I, if I were to delegate this, could that time that's freed up, could that be used better elsewhere? Um, I think that's sort of the question that I was always asking myself. There's a really good book. Um, the title right now is escaping me, but um, the author says, you know, if you can identify a task and you think that somebody else could do it at 80% of the quality that you can do it, then it's probably a good idea to outsource it. And I try to follow that rule. I just love how you can look at systems. Your brain works so differently than mine does. So I'm kind of in awe of you. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> it's been a pro I don't know, it's, this is going to be really dirty really quick, but I'll go to like, uh, like podcast movement, which is like the big industry conference. And there's always like, uh, like talks on systems and processes and I'm like, get so excited. <laughs> like, this is awesome. <laughs> what kind of tools? But I don't know. I, I like, I think I like structure and I like organization. And I think especially now with the baby, I realize that just being as efficient as I can, um, is just, I don't know, it's, it, that feels really important, you know? Um, and I think one like related thing is what I've just learned is I, what I used to do is I used to get up and I used to create lists and I used to say, this is my to-do list for the day. Right. But the problem is every task on your to-do list doesn't have equal weight. And so when I realized that some tasks have more weight in terms of growth of your business, those kind of things, that kind of changed stuff. So um, I'm like blanking on names of books and stuff right now, but oh, the one thing, um, that's a book that I love. And in that book, they say, instead of creating a to-do list, you should create a success list. So um, what you should do is you should write that to-do list, but then arrange it in order of priorities of how it would help your business grow. So how did you handle some of the unexpected changes since you thought that you'd be able to go all the way until September and then bang, here comes July? And you weren't really preparing for that. Yeah, uh, not as well as I want to <laughs> admit. Uh, I, to be honest, it was very overwhelming. I mean, this is our first baby, and for her to come, you know, almost two months early, I just it threw a lot of stuff into into flux. And so, I um, initially, how did I handle the initial changes? I panicked. And I freaked out. <laughs> and, uh, and I, fortunately, I, you know, have a great team. I think STC, when I first started, it was just me, myself, and I doing everything. And 
since we've since then we've been able to build you know to have a podcast editor a web person a video person a awesome virtual assistant and what i started doing with was um i i met with my va several times and i was like listen i think we just have to kind of go bare bones and can you help me with these things um at least for the next couple of months cuz i just I don't know. I'm just too overwhelmed. I can't, you know, trying to go between the house to NICU to, you know, um, to all of those different things. And then even trying to think about running a business. It was just, it was a lot. Yeah, I bet. And so what I'm hearing you say is that you had a human reaction, even though you planned. <laughs> yeah. Um, as, I don't know. It's interesting. Cause I think as much as I like to think that I have it, like, all figured out and put together. I just, it's just it's amazing how the world throws things and you just, that, things that you don't expect, you know? And um, for me, I think this entire process has just been very humbling for me. And I think it's also taught me to really value, like, and value and constantly think about what are the most important things, right? Um, I think for me, uh, and I think this is true for most of us, uh, it's very easy to like think of business success as strictly monetary. And so, but for me, what I realized is, you know, it's after at some point, some level of income, there's not, I mean, y- y- there's a sense of happiness and contentment, but you have to be really careful because the more you grow, the more stress that it adds. And the more you grow, sometimes the more pressure you feel to grow, keep growing right? But that usually comes at the expense of other stuff that's probably much more important in life, like family and relationships and all of those things. So it sounds like it's really giving you an opportunity to pull back and focus on the things that are important to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think when I first started STC, I had like all these really grand plans, like launch 10 different products and services and consulting and do all of these things. And now I think uh, just here in the last couple of weeks, I've just realized, you know, my time is so finite and I don't have to grow beyond what I'm like comfortable, you know, like I don't Mm -hmm. need to feel that external pressure to, um, measure up. So, well, and I think that there's a really fine line that we walk when, And these are my words. This may not be true for you. I tend to run a little bit on the anxious side. And the good part of that is it makes me want to prepare and plan and think ahead and forecast and troubleshoot. However, life often happens in spite of the fact that I'm trying to troubleshoot things that could happen. And so then there's a real skill in being able to be flexible and adjust when things don't go according to plan because the plan was to have everything run smoothly. So what you said right there is like almost exactly me, which is I am, I think if I'm completely honest, I think I am sort of naturally an anxious person. And I think that's part of why I plan so much. But I think one thing I've learned, and I'm still learning, I haven't figured it out all the time. But yeah, you're right. Like sometimes, especially with a, a baby, you know, there's just stuff you can't control, right? You can say, you know, you're going to feed the baby every three hours and that should leave you a 45 minute window to work on something related to business, but baby may decide uh, she doesn't want to feed the full amount. So now it's going to throw everything off. Right. So I don't know. I think it's just for me, I think the biggest thing in all of this has just been to be kind to myself and really focus on self-care. Um, I'm a big self-care person, but I don't think I valued it as much until now. Like for, you know, for example, now, I mean, we're still really early. The baby's only just a few months. So I try to prioritize, honestly, sleep and exercise. Um, sleep first, um, actually sleep, nutrition, then exercise, and then business stuff. Yeah. And I think that that's so important, you know, that I think often we think self-care looks like massages and, you know, fancy meals out. And that is self-care. But especially if you're someone who's wired in a way, you know, for me, I call it the proper care and feeding of the highly sensitive person. That Mm -hmm. that's a term that works for me. But the basics are so important. And sometimes self-care is really about discipline. And that's something that I see that you really excel at is your ability to be disciplined in your life. Yeah, I uh no, thank you for saying that. I I can't like 
I, I was very, I think, very fortunate to have parents and grandparents who had a, just a, a strong work ethic and who really taught me that it's not always like these big grand things that, you know, matter, that it's really in the small steps, you know, in the small little steps of discipline that where you get those big results over time. Is there anything that you would have done differently? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing is just when you ask that question, I think I would have gone going back to the sleep thing. I think I would have just been more gracious and more gentle with myself to let me say, you know what, Mel, you know, it was nice before the baby where you could go to sleep at nine o'clock and wake up at four forty every day, but that's not going to happen now. So I would just be more kind to myself and just say, you know, Hey, it's okay to sleep a little bit later and get the rest you need because if you're rested, then you're a better clinician, you're a better business owner, you're a better husband, you're a better dad, all of those different things. So I think for the first, gosh, Patricia, I would say, I don't know, seven, eight weeks, I would say at least. Um, I've, I like, I don't know if this, I mean, I'm going to even articulate this well, but I, on one hand, I realized the importance of self-care and I knew, I know that, you know, sleeping and sleep particularly for me is really important. Um, I just notice it has an impact on my mood and everything. Um, so I noticed that, but then on the other hand, I felt this pull of the business owner, right? What if I'm not grinding every day? What if I'm not, you know, and I don't know, I just, I really battled with that sort of guilt and, and vacillating between those two feelings. So feeling like you should have been able to keep up with the structure and the discipline that you had before the baby and then having a hard time adjusting to like, oh, now I have another little person to be thinking about. Yeah. Or yeah. And, and I think related to that is like on one hand, realizing self-care is important, but on the other hand, just realizing I need to still get stuff done for the business and what, what, how do I, you know, balance that. And I think giving myself permission to say, you know what, it's okay to slow down in this season of the business um, and, and focus on stuff like sleep and <laughs> in making sure you're eating well and being fully present with the baby um, and all of those things. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So can you just tell everybody briefly about what your routine looked like before the baby came? Your yeah. morning routine? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, uh, I actually have a whole podcast episode on my morning routine, which is, it was fun to create that episode. But um, basically, what I, I love I, that episode. Yeah, I don't know. I, I was like, I was kind of conflicted about creating. I was like, who's going to listen to this? But I've gotten some really nice feedback from it. So what I've done is um, I noticed that, so this is part of it is, is just a bunch of stuff I've learned, read. Um, I've and noticed stuff about myself. I noticed that I'm highly productive in the morning. Um, and the, sort of the research and science says that, you know, when we're rested, we tend to be the most creative and all of those things, right? Um, before a whole bunch of tasks come at us, then if we can control those things and um, get things done early in the morning, it tends to, you, we tend to get more stuff done. So I usually get up before, I used to get up at 4.40. This was Monday um, through Saturday, because Saturday morning I go play basketball with friends. So I still get up that early, but um, Monday through Friday, 4.40 in the morning, um, 4.45 to 5, brush, brush my teeth, you know, get ready, all that kind of stuff. 5 to 5.45 is exercise, and then I do some sort of a morning routine. So that involves uh, watching a TED Talk, uh, just because what I noticed is I used to check my email initially, and that used to just overwhelm me, um, or I used to just go and, like, read ESPN or something, you know? Uh, but I love watching TED Talks because one, it gets my creative mind going. Um, and then it also just kind of centers me in a way. So I watch a, a TED Talk, then I do just a brief, like, deep breathing exercise. One thing I haven't done that I want to incorporate is some sort of a journaling, like a brief journaling thing. But that's basically what I do. So exercise, um, deep breathing, a TED Talk, and then by um, six in the morning, um, I'm ready to start my day. So um, again, this is before the baby, but six to 7.30, I would work. So I, usually what I do is the night before, I write down the three important tasks that I need to do for the next day. And I prioritize those in terms of 
um, sort of business, like which would have the most impact on business. And then I would um, knock down that first task um, for that hour and a half. Uh, and then Susan would be getting ready to go to work around 7, 7, 15, 7 30. So um, I would, you know, be with her during that time. Uh, and then from 7 30 to 8 30, that's like breakfast, um, take a shower, that kind of stuff. Eight uh, from 8 30 to gosh, one o'clock. Um, that's sort of my work time. Um, we can talk more about this if it's interesting, but I break my days into 25 minute chunks. And so I, I work really intensely for 25 minutes. And then for five minutes, I take a break and then also take that time just to analyze if the previous 25 minutes was the best use of that time to do that task. Wow. You and I are wired really differently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is it's really hard for me to not go into comparison but like I just have to know that you have a style that works for you I would love to be as disciplined as you are but transitions are so hard so to work and then take five minutes off like that would turn to 20 minutes so it's just interesting to see the reactions that come up for me and I admire your discipline so much yeah and I think but it's to your point like I think this is what works for me and the reality is you know I didn't I never before like I never got up at four, um, 40 before in fact I used to get up I think closer to 650 maybe seven um and then what i started realizing was i just had a lot more energy in the mornings so then i just thought uh well side slight slight um side tangent um my brother and i we used to go to india a lot of our summers because my grandparents and a lot of my mom's side is still there uh and this is when we were growing up and my parents and my grandparents we used to live with my grandparents and my grandparents would wake up super early and i think i got used to that as well and so i just realized you know what i'm so focused in the mornings and what if i just start working back like waking up 15 minutes earlier and i just kept working myself back and um, I try to even go a little earlier than 4.30, but then I noticed like I was just more tired and I was like, this isn't worth it, you know? So this this felt good and comfortable for me. But it's really a strength and a gift that you have because I'm an early riser. Well, I wake up early. I don't get out of bed early. Hmm. So like, again, I just want to point out that these are traits that you have that I think are really defined and specialized that you're able to pull in that discipline and it works really well for you. I mean, I... I'm kind of in awe, like I said. <laughs> no, thank you. I um, I don't know. I just, I, I, I like. There's something very gratifying uh, about it being eight o'clock in the morning, and you know that you've accomplished, or at least put a good dent into the most important task of the day. Absolutely, and I think that there's something really esteeming about when we can harness our time and our activities that it's skill building and strength building and then we know that we can accomplish things because we've we've sh demonstrated that we can do that consistently i think it's a great skill to have mm. yeah yeah no absolutely um thanks for saying that sure so tell me some of the things that you know you never really would have imagined in spite of all the planning that you did what things came up that you're like whoa <laughs> <laughs> um just with the, with the baby and just with planning, like the sort of intersection with business and baby? Whatever you want to share, I would love to hear about. Oh, man, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, so I think one was around like the baby's feeding, sleeping schedule. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when she was in the NICU, they had her pretty, because she needed to gain weight, right? So it was basically eight feedings uh, every 24 hours, so basically feed every three hours. And so when she came home, and fortunately, I mean, she only had to stay in NICU for about two and a half weeks, which initially I think they had projected around five to seven just because she was like seven weeks early, but she did great. And so when she came home, we were like, this is awesome. She's already on the, she's already like super regimented and scheduled. And she was for the first like couple of weeks, but then you know, she got comfortable and she's growing, right? So she needs more quantity. She's, her, her personality's developing, all of those things. So um, I think one thing I just learned is 
you know, I, I can plan as much as I want, but there's just stuff that the baby's going to do that I cannot anticipate, you know? Um, and so I don't know, I, I keep going back to this, but I think the biggest lesson I just learned is to be graceful. Um, I, just with myself. I feel like a lot of us struggle with this because we're high achievers. We want to get a lot of things done. And I think, um, at least for me, like I'm really hard on myself when I don't get things done. And I think part of what I've really had to do is just learn to be even more kind to myself. Yeah, I think that's the gift that children give us if we're in a space like we can either try and get the child to conform to our needs and our schedule and then you end up with a neurotic child Mm. or... (laughs) (laughs) you know, you learn to be more child-centered, but still have that balance that you need in your life. And it sounds like that's really what you've been trying to wiggle your way through imperfectly, which is how we do it. Yeah. um, And wiggle is probably the best word. (laughs) You know, and this is the thing, you know, uh, and to be honest, like for me is, you know, I'll figure out something and then I've kind of got and then I'll, I'll set the pace, right? So like, this is a way to do it. And then I'll just kind of repeat that same thing. But with a baby, right? You could do something like, for example, you know, a certain way of feeding could work one day, but the other day doesn't really work, right? So I think for me, the biggest thing is just holding loosely to, to positions, to time, to all of those different things. Like um, I had mentioned this to you, but even like with the sleep thing, like I used to wake up that 4.30, 4.40. Um, now I wait cl- up closer to seven just because, you know, with a couple of feedings at night, we're losing, you know, 35 mm-hmm. to an hour, 35 minutes to an hour. And so if I'm trying to get up at 430, I mean, I can't fully function on four hours of sleep, you know? Right. It's consistently inconsistent. Right. Yeah. Did you know that you could have so much love for another little human being? Uh, no idea. I I had multiple friends and loved ones tell me this, that you'll never, you'll feel this sense of joy and love that you'll, you've never experienced before. And I was like, well, I'm a pretty sensitive person. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, like, I think I can, you know, I think at least generally I felt pretty deeply, but yeah, no, it's, it's very true. Uh, you know, even now, like we're recording this and I'm just, I know, you know, she's with her grandparents, but you know, there's a sense of like, I miss her and you know, she like, she started social smiling recently and it's like so adorable because, you know, and, uh, I don't know. And she, you know, she smiled before I left and it was just so sweet. So it's just like that image is in my mind. Yeah. I think it really gives us an opportunity to be so in the present moment mm-hmm. and to kind of let go of the schedules and the tasks and the to do, because you really get an opportunity to see the world through this fresh new little spirit that you know, just responds to everything. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is interesting to that point because, you know, the, like recently she's now really fascinated by, you know, patterns and by, you know, like shadows and lights. So she'll just stare at one thing for like minutes. And I'm like, and then I love, and I was just thinking about that the other day, like just her curiosity about the world, you know? And um, I don't know. I, I feel like as much as I'm trying to teach her, you know, we're trying to teach her as parents. I feel like I'm learning a lot more about slowing down and just being intentional and appreciating the day-to-day and the moment-to-moment of life. It kind of gives us an opportunity to go through ages and stages of our life where we may have needed more. We don't know that we didn't get it, but as our kids go through those stages, we kind of get a chance to not only reparent ourselves, Mm. but to experience it differently and to show up for our kids in a way that maybe you know, we would have liked someone to be there for us. So it's really a great opportunity. Never thought of it that way. Um, I love that, that word of reparenting. Um, Yeah. And I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. And you know how you get to find out when those times are? No, how? (laughs) When parenting really sucks and you hate it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's a good barometer. (laughs) You know, and I'm laughing, but it's very serious. You know, that if your parents had a really hard time with you as a toddler or as a teen, like those are the times when parenting gets really, really hard because we didn't get the modeling that we needed. And now we're getting a chance to deal with it with our own kids. Hmm. Yeah. That's very, that's very insightful. Something to look forward to. Woohoo. Oh, joy. (laughs) (laughs) Melvin, is there anything else that you want to share before we wrap up? Um, 
Not that I, not that I can think of. I think just the biggest takeaway from all of this is like this episode, I wanted it to be less of, you know, like here's some concrete business things, but more of just an open or honest conversation. I think just the one thing I could share is just to be gracious and kind to yourself during the season. You know, a on one hand, like for me, I'm just so task oriented sometimes to a fault. And I think one thing parenthood is teaching me is just to appreciate the moments because she's not going to be this little forever, you know? Mm -hmm. And if I'm just so focused on, you know, um, putting her to sleep so I can get stuff done. And of course there's times I have to do that, but if that becomes my sole focus, then the stage of her life just comes and goes. Right. And then I look back and I'm like, how did she get so much bigger? Like what happened? You know? Right. And I think just having that awareness, like as parents, we're going to do it imperfectly, no matter how great our intentions are. But the fact that you have that awareness is already a huge shift and it's already making a difference. Yeah, um, I hope so. Um, Thank you for saying that. I I don't know, this is such a, a new, I feel like in some ways, this is like the first time you ever have like a mock therapy session, right? Yeah. Or the first, like you, you read all these books, you know, all this stuff. And then when you go into the room and somebody's like there and you're like, uh, okay, open-ended question, closed-ended question, right. <laughs> you know? So it's like, I don't know. I feel like I still have my training wheels on. I'll probably have it on for a while. But well, you don't really get a dress rehearsal for having kids and not your first one. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, you know, and and the thing you just also appreciate is just how unique every child is, right? I mean, we have friends that are like, oh, our, you know, our baby sleeps seven hours a night. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Our sleeps two and a half to three. <laughs> we wake up, you know, a couple of times a night, but, you know, but still she's, she's her own person, right? And I don't know. I just uh, learning to appreciate the beautiful chaos and all of this. Yep. That's a, that's a great term, beautiful chaos. And just one thing, it, it's so easy to get into the comparing of, you know, what are the other kids doing? What milestones are they reaching? What are parents, you know, are, do they let them cry it out? Do they pick them up? It's so easy to get so wrapped up in that, but it sounds like, you know, you and Susan have really aligned your values and that you're really focused on the baby and what the baby needs you're going to do it imperfectly. That's how we, that's how we model to our kids imperfect parenting. If we were perfect parents, that really wouldn't be a great model for our kids. So I think just the fact that you recognize all of that and just the fact that you have such a a huge heart and you care so much, she's just so blessed to have both of you as parents. Um, Thank you, Patricia. I, uh, yeah, we're, uh, you know, it's been a tough season in many ways, but we're uh, just so grateful to be parents and, I think it's just been neat how my own eyes have been open to what really is important in life. Yep. This will be a year of wonderful milestones for your whole family. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm so grateful you took the time to listen. I really want to set up a community where I can hear from you and know what you like or what you don't like to hear about topics. There's a Facebook group called Unapologetically Sensitive. If you want to hop on over there, I'm going to set up some polls, but I really want to create content that's meaningful to you. If you'd like to join my weekly newsletter, my plan is to send out just one newsletter a week, letting you know about the upcoming episode, anything that's coming up. You can go to unapologeticallysensitive.com if you'd like to sign up and be on the email list. If you want to reach out to me directly, You can go to the same website and there's a tab where you can send me an email. Being sensitive is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. 